All right. Well, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants event. My name is Joe Grabowski, and I'll be your host for today. Really awesome to be able to keep these events going. So normally we'd be broadcasting live in the classrooms across North America and beyond, but obviously with our set of circumstances, it's pretty cool to be able to use technology to beam these events live into homes so of parents, educators, uh, and students. So, so great to have uh, everybody tuning in live with us today. So we are about to jump into today's event. Use the chat sidebar on the right to introduce yourself, send us in some questions, and of course we'll work those into the event. But today I'm excited to introduce Jermina Garland-Lewis. She is a Seattle-based photographer, eco-health researcher, and National Geographic Explorer with experience in over 30 countries across six continents. Her photography and research explore the multiple connections between humans, animals, and their shared environments. She's passionate about taking the worlds of storytelling uh, and research and intertwining them in different ways to reach a broad uh, audience. She's an avid outdoor adventurer and environmental steward. She can likely be found in the mountains or on the ocean, chasing the light with a camera and a silly grin on her face. Jamina, it's always a pleasure to be able to host you. Thanks for coming to us live from the West Coast and we're looking forward to getting to know you a little bit better. And of course, we'll fire away with a little Q&A action. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Joe. And uh, always good to be here. And thank you so much to all of you guys joining in on YouTube right now. Sorry, I can't see your faces, but I hope everyone is doing well at home. And uh, I'm excited to share a little bit about my work with you today and then hear some of the questions that you have. So I'll just, before I move into some of the photos I'm going to share today, just uh, introduce myself saying that I think photographer makes a lot of sense to people. We understand what that means. Um, but the eco health researcher part of my title is a little bit more confusing. Um, and basically what that means is that I um, am, as my work as a scientist, look at the different types of connections between human health, animal health and environmental health. Um, and my work as a photographer and a scientist overall looks at these different types of relationships that we build between as people with the animals in our in our environment. And so that's what you're going to see um, a little bit more of in my work today. So let me go ahead and share some photos with you guys here. And All right. So I like to give a little bit of an introduction about how I got to um, the type of work that I do as well, because it's not really a sort of traditional career path. And um, so I like to, to share some of the stories of, of how I came to be this kind of explorer. And so I was really lucky to grow up with parents who loved the outdoors. And we were always camping, backpacking, um, just exploring national parks, all these places. And um, they were happy to just let me run around and explore, obviously. Um, and so I started to form my own relationship with the outdoors um, at a really young age. And um, when I was 12 is when I found photography. And photography for me was just immediately this really important way um, to share with my community um, what I was experiencing being in the outdoors, that relationship that I was building, stories from people or places that I was encountering along the way. And so I've had a camera attached to some part of my body for um, over 20 years now. It's just kind of become a, a different limb for me um, because I really value um, what it can do to share these incredible places um, with, with um, folks all around the world. And so that's still really important to me. My own relationship with the outdoors um, is still something I value. I'm still going out by myself on these trips um, to spend time um, because that's really where um, the basis of my work as a photographer and a scientist and looking at how other people form relationships um, with these spaces, that's really where that comes from is growing up um, with that own sort of curiosity and that connection um, to nature myself. And so the animal that first got me interested and really kind of opened my eyes to the work that I do now is this mountain gorilla. And this is work that I did when I was in college um, with community in Uganda. And so what happens there is because we are so closely related to gorillas, um, 
that we can actually share a lot of the same diseases. And so what's happening in this part of East Africa um, with these, these very endangered mountain gorillas um, is that the human diseases that are there in the community can make the gorillas sick. And that becomes a really big problem for conservation. And so that was when it all kind of clicked in my head that um, you can't think about humans and environment and people separately. Um, our health is all connected um, because we share these spaces. And so um, that sort of changed my framework into how do we think um, about how we everyone benefits the other. So if we make human health better, that'll help the gorillas, that'll help this environment here. Um, and so that's kind of the approach that that, um, that project really started in me. That being said, the animal that I've spent most of my time with is a super different animal. It's a big whale. Um, and so I have worked the longest with different types of relationships that humans have with whales. Um, and that can be um, either for things like fun or tourism, whale watching. Um, so that has some economic um, parts as well, but also uh, with maybe some spiritual history, religion, different particularly indigenous communities around the world have formed all sorts of really important bonds with whales. Um, in that sense, um, whaling, I work a lot with whaling as well. So hunting whales, um, both historically and countries that still do that. And that can be, you know, food is another really important relationship that we make with animals. And so these are all different things that I, I look at. And I was fortunate after college to be able to spend a year in seven different countries looking at these different relationships that different countries form with whales. And so I won't go through them all, but I wanna point out the, the blue dot in the middle of the North Atlantic. Um, so in between North America and Europe, and those are the Azores. And those are Portuguese islands out there. And that has, um, I, I first went there during that project, but I completely fell in love with, with it there. And that's continued to be where I work as a National Geographic Explorer. And so what that means is just that National Geographic has has been able to give me some money to, to do the project, uh, my photography project in the Azores. And so what's really special there um, is that they used to hunt whales, um, but they did it out of these boats that you see here, these seven man canoes. Um, and it's really similar in some ways to the ways that Americans used to hunt whales in the 1800s, if you know Moby Dick or any of that sort of era, it's similar to those whale boats. Um, but instead of stopping this method, of, you know, when most other parts of the world did, they continued to hunt this way until 1986, which is within my lifetime. Um, and that's pretty crazy to me. And so it was in these boats going after sperm whales. Um, they only hunted sperm whales, um, but, because no one else was doing this so long, these men who were doing this are the last people alive who could say what it was like to, to be in that small boat trying to hunt a whale. And it's, a, it's an important part of the history um, for this place as well as um, America. And, and so there hadn't really been a lot of work to, to hear people's stories. And so my work, I also, I photograph people, but I also collect their stories. Um, and so I went around to photograph as many of the men who had done this as I could um, and to hear what they had to say about that time of their life. Most of them have died since I started this work 11 years ago. And that's sort of really driven home how important it is um, to, to have these images, to have these stories collected before we lose these parts of our history and our culture. And so that's another really valuable part of, of this kind of work. And so now I work a lot with the younger generations who sort of honor that part of their heritage, um, who don't want to hunt whales anymore, but who honor that heritage um, through racing the whale boats, rowing them, sailing them. And so can keep that connection, but it changes. So they're still connected to the whale, but it looks different than it used to. And so that's kind of how I got to, to where I am and some of the work that I do. But I wanna step back and just talk a little bit more generally about um, the connections um, of how I work as a photographer and what I'm looking for because I photograph 
um, stories that are about this connection between people and animals and the environment. That means I need to be comfortable photographing people. It means I need to know how to shoot wildlife um, environments. So there's all these different things that, that can go into my work. And so I'm thinking about ways to, to show those connections when I photograph. So, you know, within the same space here in Tanzania, um, both the people and the wildlife in these environments, working up in Alaska um, with the Flinket uh, community up there and the orcas that are, are really important um, in their landscape and their cultural history. And so I'm always thinking about how to visually show these sorts of connections as well. Um, because of the work that I do, I also often will work with veterinarians and human doctors who are working together. And remember I was saying earlier that uh, humans and gorillas have a lot of, um, you know, we're really related and so we can have some common health issues. And so sometimes I'll work with veterinarians and doctors um, who are doing medical work on, on wildlife um, and photograph that part so we can show again how we're all connected, how we can learn um, about human health from animal health and vice versa. I work with conservation researchers as well, um, people who are doing wildlife rehabilitation projects or work with uh, strandings of wildlife um, and just the more we can can learn. And so this gets this gets these stories out into the world to have photography um, be a part of that to share this research that's being done all over. Um, and so that's that's a way that I can share that bridge of science and photography as well. Um, I want to talk a little bit, I have a couple sort of examples of what this actually looks like when I get to work both in science and photography. I know it sounds kind of like it's two different worlds. Um, and so I just want to show a little bit about what this actually looks like for my work. And so I want to start us in Thailand. Um, and this is a community that I worked in a few years ago that has this monkey forest. And it's really, really small amount of forest that's left. Um, but the monkeys are very important to them um, for spirituality, um, for fun. It's really important to go and feed the monkeys in this forest. Um, but what that means is that with very little land and a lot of food coming in from people, there are so many monkeys. There's way more monkeys than can fit in this forest anymore. And because of that, that means that they're starting to come out of the forest more and more. Um, but it also means there's not enough food for them inside the forest that's natural source of food. And so there are these people here like this, this man, he works for the government. It's his job to go out and feed the monkeys every morning. Um, and so what happens as these monkeys go out is that we're seeing this conflict with people um, because people want the monkeys uh, if they're in the forest, but they don't want them coming into their homes. And monkeys are pretty crazy. And, and you know, they'll come up, you see this here on the left, they'll come up, they'll surround your house, they'll try to figure out ways to get in, they will get in, they'll take your food, they'll open your refrigerator, they'll take your clothes, they'll take your lipstick. I heard all sorts of crazy stories from people. Um, and so there's a really common pastime of people with slingshots and a bucket of rocks outside their front door. And that's what they spend their afternoon or their morning doing is trying to scare the monkeys away. Um, and so these are the sorts of uh, dynamics that I'll look at um, as a photographer and a scientist is, is how do you know, people have this one relationship with monkeys that's very positive in the forest just down the street. But then when it comes into their community or their house, it becomes very negative and it becomes a lot of conflict. And how do we understand that better to make sure that both the people and the monkeys can be safe and healthy in this area. And this is a terrible photo, but it's a silly story. So I like to share it because it's a little bit about what kind of doing this work actually can mean. Um, and so uh, we have to take poop samples. That's one of the things that I do as a scientist is collect poop um, from people or animals because we can learn a lot about the health of an individual from different things in its poop. And so we turned our back for just a couple of minutes and this monkey started going through all our stuff and he found the poop sample that we had just, we were biking back um, uh, from the person that we had collected it from. And he opened up the sample, it was in a little jar 
and smelled it and thought it was disgusting because it was and then dumped it all over the sidewalk. And so we had to figure out how to clean that up. Um, and so sometimes it's not always glamorous to do these sorts of things. Sometimes you have to deal with some pretty strange and unexpected situations. Um, and then the last uh, story I wanna share with you guys about what my work can, looks like is uh, Papua New Guinea. Um, and this is actually quite different than what I just talked about in Thailand because there the issue was very little um, in natural environment left and a lot of people and the conflict that can come from that. But here in Papua New Guinea, there's a lot of land. There's a lot of land, it's very remote and not as many people out in this area. And what's really cool here is that the people in these communities in these remote areas are dedicating their land to conservation. So we call it community conservation. When it doesn't come like, uh, you know, from the government, maybe like a national park, this is something that the community with the land they own is turning over for wildlife conservation in their area. And so um, I wanna show this little video um, just to give a sense of how we get into some of these uh, areas that we go into for work. Um, and I don't know if you can already see where we're going to land this plane, but I'm in, I'm in the front seat here of the plane in a, um, very tiny plane. You can see it was a little bit bumpy <laughs> um, and we didn't know for a while where exactly we were going to land until you see that little thin strip. It almost looks like a piece of spearmint gum from high up, but um, just to give a sense of what it takes to get into some um, And so this is what life looks like for a lot of folks in these areas. Um, and so they're really living in their environment. You know, this isn't an urban area that has wildlife nearby they are fully immersed in that ecosystem that they live in. And so people there have a lot of different ways that they um, spend time with wildlife. And so I talked about community conservation. Um, that is, it serves a dual purpose. It's so that the wildlife still have healthy populations, but that's also important for the people and for human health because people here need to eat wildlife to survive because there's no stores, there's no grocery stores. This is very far away from that kind of development. And so people still need to hunt wildlife in order to have a nutritious diet and to survive. Um, and so it's important that they have these areas dedicated where they don't hunt so that these populations remain healthy, um, both for the animals and for the people. But people also sometimes will take these wildlife in as pets. Um, and so that's another interesting thing to me too, is, you know, sometimes it's something that you're going to eat. Sometimes it's something that you're going to bring in and, and have as a pet as well. So exploring those differences. Water is part of this too. We, you know, when they don't have uh, plumbing or a faucet that comes into the house, they're drinking from the streams, from the rivers in their area. So how do you make sure that the water is safe um, for them to drink and for the animals that are in that environment? Um, so that's another thing that we look at. Um, animals that we eat too, that we raise for food. So I've been talking about hunting uh, wildlife, but we also raise animals for food and that can be a really important relationship as well. And there can be a lot of ceremony and significance um, for that as well. And so I'll just end by saying um, that I've talked about some pretty far away places right now. And I am really fortunate to get to travel a lot for the work that I do. But that doesn't mean that these sorts of stories or these issues are only somewhere far away and a really crazy difficult plane ride to get to. Um, they're in our backyards too. And I love being able to work in my own community, in my city, in my state, because these sorts of stories are, are here as well. And so this is here in Seattle. These are all crows. We have this crazy thing every winter where like 20,000 crows every night come to spend the night in this one area. 
Um, and so you can find these things in your own communities as well. And I encourage you guys to, to um, start to look for these things um, and these different experiences that we have with wildlife, even in urban areas, um, in your own communities. I've been able to work with researchers um, in my own community, in my own state, on things like pollinators and wildflowers. These are citizen science projects. So that means you guys as students can also get out and engage with them. Plastics is another really big important one um, that there's all sorts of ways you can, can work on um, as a citizen scientist. And they're great opportunities to make photographs, to help collect data for science. Um, and this is really um, what matters to me most is finding these ways to partner as a photographer with schools, um, universities, community groups, nonprofits, because photography for me is a way that we can connect on a human level um, because we love stories as people. We connect emotionally with that. We connect with visuals. Um, and that can make us care about these issues. And then by partnering with these other organizations, you can actually really make that change. Um, and so that is a bit about the work that I do and what that looks like. Awesome, Jamina, thanks so much for sharing. I love uh, those photos. You've been able to visit some pretty incredible places all over the world. And uh, you know, it, it's always neat when you kind of forge your own path. So you know, taking your photography, using it to tell those stories and focusing on that eco health component about how we can kind of coexist better with the animals around us, the habitat around us and what that does for our health. Pretty awesome. All right. So just a quick little reminder, chat sidebar is on the right. Let us know where you're watching from. And of course, send us in some questions. And we've got a few here to start uh, us off. And this one always comes up when we talk to a photographer. They're curious about the camera that you're using now? Do you use multiples or one that you're just loving right now? What do you, what's your gear? So I have a number of different cameras that I shoot with, um, especially right now, because one of the things I'm doing with this time um, of being home a lot more is to get back into film. And so I actually just loaded my film camera for the first time in about 15 years yesterday. And so I've shot with Canon for most of my work as a photographer, even when I was shooting film. Um, and, but as I've moved into digital, I've, I've exclusively shot with Canon. Um, I have two different types of bodies that I shoot with now. Um, but I also like to play around with, with different types of cameras. And so I have, a uh, a disposable film camera I'm messing around with sometimes too. And of course, iPhones now can be really useful in um, sort of making photography accessible to everybody. These big cameras can be super expensive um, and harder to learn with. And so I do also really love to, to um, use my iPhone sometimes as well. And I teach photography as well. I work with National Geographic Expeditions. Um, and so one of my favorite things on that is to get to, to work with people in their, in their gear, no matter where they're at, no matter what camera they have and show them ways that they can improve their photography. Um, Cause it's about you as the photographer, not about the gear that you have. All right, very cool. Um, so hearing you talk about that just got me thinking about film and the last time I used film in a camera, what is it about film that kind of draws you back to keep using it? Is it that you just kind of have to think about your th shots a little bit more because you only really get a limited number of chances? Yeah, film is such an interesting way to do photography. And I've always been really grateful that I started with that um, because it is really easy now with digital to just, uh, you know, we call it spray and pray, like just take you know, millions of photos and hope that something is, is what you wanted. Um, but with film, you, you, you can't do that. You, you only have a, a few, you know, 24, or maybe 36 pictures on a roll. And, and so it really requires you to think a lot harder about what you want to create. Um, and it makes you move slower. It makes you take a photograph with a lot more intention. Um, and it makes you kind of think through the whole process a little bit more. Um, you can't see it right away to see if you messed up. So you need to, to know what you're um, setting up ahead of time a lot more because you can't correct it right away. 
And so it's a completely different mindset. And I, I really um, encourage, you know, if we have any photographers out there, I encourage um, trying to, to shoot with film, even if you don't have film, there's a way that you can, you know, kind of mess with your digital camera enough, put it in manual settings and um, turn over your, your screen and just different things that you can do and give yourself, you know, a, an afternoon when you only get to take 24 pictures. Um, and, you know, we can kind of create that same mindset um, with a digital camera, just with a few little alterations. And I think it's a really great exercise for people who are interested in improving their photography. All right, very cool. Well, I'll give a shout out to Owen and Katie, who I can see have just introduced themselves uh, in the chat. Don't forget to send in some questions. We have another one here about the gorillas. You showed some pictures of uh, from when you were in Uganda early uh, in your career and your adventures. And this question is about um, when you're working with the gorillas, did you have to wear a face mask when you were up with them? That's a really great question. Um, I did not have to wear um, a face mask when I was working with the gorillas because um, I was never that close um, to them. Um, certainly they can get close to you and that's sort of, you know, you have to be careful of wildlife can sort of move around you how they like to, but, you know, we need to keep a distance from them. Um, but that's a really important issue as well. And, um, you know, for tourists who are coming in, if you do want to go see the gorillas, it's really important that you not go if you're sick. Um, and the same thing for people who are there as park rangers or as researchers um, that we take these precautions. And certainly um, the folks who are getting closer to gorillas than I was for their work are taking protective measures in that way. Um, but yeah, if you guys ever have a chance to get out there, um, that's something certainly like make sure that you're taking precautions and, and don't, um, you know, it's, I know it's a once in a lifetime experience for you, but you don't want to go if you're sick um, because we don't want to take that chance. So that's a really great question and great insight into the, the problem. Yeah, absolutely. We hear a lot about, you know, how some viruses and such can be transferred from uh, animals to us, but we don't always hear about how the exact same thing can go the other way that we can in fact uh, transmit some of our illnesses uh, in that other direction. Exactly. All right. So you shared the story in the Azores with us, uh, talking to the whalers, hunting the sperm whales. What other species of whale have you seen uh, in the wild on your adventures? Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have been really fortunate to see a lot of different species of whales. Um, my two, the two that I've probably spent the most time with other than sperm whales are um, humpback whales, which is the, the whale that I showed a photo of breaching um, and southern right whales. And southern right whales, uh, fewer people um, have know as much about if they're up in the northern hemisphere um, because the northern right whales are doing very poorly. Their population is really, really low. Um, but in, this, in the southern hemisphere, they're actually coming back quite well. And the thing that I love about both southern right whales and humpback whales is that they're super curious. Whales, different whale species have totally different personalities. Um, and so sperm whales are, I love them, but they're actually kind of boring to, to watch on the surface. They're not boring in the least with what they're doing underneath the surface. They're incredible. Um, but when they come to the surface, they've been diving so long and so deep that they kind of just want to rest and breathe. And, you know, they're not doing all these crazy jumps and twirls and things um, like humpback whales. And, and so for the surface, humpback whales and southern rights, it's been such a joy to spend time with them because they'll be really curious. They'll come up and uh, want to see what the boat's doing and they're much more active. Um, and so those are, those are the two that I've spent most of my time with. I still haven't seen a blue whale and I'm, that's one of these days. There's always something to look forward to. That'd be pretty awesome. Uh, okay, uh, let's see here. Um, okay, so you you know you document you talk to a lot of uh, of these of the whalers who um, uh, you know used to hunt uh, up right up until the eighties. Did they ever talk about the dangers of hunting? It seems like you're in a really small boat. 
Um, it seems like the whale, you know, sperm whales are huge. The, the sperm whale could have had just as much of a chance of, of hurting them and getting away as they could have actually been successful. Yes, absolutely. That is one of the questions that um, I always ask. And even if I don't ask it, that comes up. Um, def- it was dangerous. It's, it's way more dangerous than, you know, what most of us consider our, our work these days. And um, the craziest story I ever heard from someone there um, was that they had um, harpooned the whale um, and the whale got really upset, which was, um, you know, often happened and it started swimming really fast and it came back and it actually swam up, um, and smashed them from underneath their boat. And it sent everybody flying into the air and it broke the boat. And this one man who's telling me the story actually landed inside the mouth of the whale when he fell and he got stuck on one of the teeth and the sperm, so sperm whale teeth are really big. They only have teeth on their lower jaw, but they're huge. And so he landed on a tooth and it just kind of was like a needle stitch through the side of his ribs. And he got carried down with the whale and the whale's swimming and he's thinking, this is it. I'm, you know, saying goodbye to my family. And, and then he realized, um, that he wasn't in the mouth, but he was still attached by the the rope from the harpoon by his leg. And so he undid himself and swam to the surface. And then the whale came back up and hit him um, into the boat again. And then it swam off and he was pulled from the water, taken to a hospital. He was in the hospital for two months. He went out whaling again the week he got out. And I don't know about you, but I don't know that I would would, uh, go back to that um, quite so readily, but it also shows that this, you know, there weren't a lot of opportunities out there for people for sure. work. It wasn't like this was one of a million things people could do. Um, they're really out of the way islands and this was important for, for their economy. And, um, but yeah, it's, it's crazy in my work that I get to talk to people who have been inside the mouth of a sperm whale. Um, I just didn't, I didn't think that that would be a story I ever heard. And so, you know, that kind of um, story is what keeps me pushing um, with this work because it's so incredible the things you learn about what people have lived through. Sure. Awesome. Crazy story. And then back in the water like a week later, pretty wild. Uh, okay. Give a shout out to Caleb. Caleb's a student uh, in Puerto Basque's uh, Newfoundland who's tuning in with us right now. So don't forget to send us in a uh, question, Caleb. We've already had some awesome questions and let's get to another one. What's the longest time you ever spent trying to get the shot that you wanted? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, I haven't, because I, I don't, the type of wildlife photography that I do doesn't tend to, um, you know, involve, or it hasn't so far been with wildlife where like, I have to set up, um, you know, a blind in the forest and I live in this little space for four weeks, hoping the bird will fly into the scene that I've set up. And I have a lot of respect for people who do that. Um, But I certainly, I think for me, um, it takes time to, to see the story evolve and to think through that and to think through, I might spend less time on the individual image Um, but I'm thinking through what I need to tell that whole story. And so what are the different things that I have to bring in to, to share that and ideally in as few images as possible that are as strong as possible to weave that together. Um, and so I love working on projects long-term. Um, and so, you know, I've been working in the Azores for 11 years. I've been working on some of my other projects here in Seattle for six years. Um, And so in some ways it's taken me years to get the shots that I want because um, I'm looking at that longer term story um, overall. And that's important to me to to keep working with the communities that I've I've started my work with. Okay, very cool. We had a chat with Gabby Salazar a couple of weeks ago, another Nat Geo uh, Mm -hmm. photographer. And she told us about this hat she has that she puts on her head and then it comes out and covers her whole body. Uh, <laughs> I'd like a built-in hide, but she yeah. wouldn't put it on for us. So that was a little disappointing. <laughs> Come on, Gabby. <laughs> yeah. 
All right. Uh, okay, so you shared that story uh, about uh, working with uh, the monkeys. And the question here is about, were there any eco health uh, risks involved with uh, people living in such close proximity to so many um, monkey species like that? Yeah, that's another super great question. Um, and so the reason that we were collecting poop from people and the monkeys was actually to look at um, whether or not they had any of the same parasites um, because they are living in those really close quarters um, because maybe there's exposure um, to some of those parasites through um, water or food or because there's so many monkeys everywhere. Um, so there are certainly risks. Um, one of the other things that can happen in, in other communities, um, it's not happening right now in this community, but other communities where there are a lot of monkeys um, is sometimes, especially if there's food involved, um, monkeys can become really aggressive. Um, and so there are other parts of um, particular area also work in those parts of Indonesia where there is more aggression. And so they're also trying to figure out how do we prevent that from, from happening? How do we keep it from getting worse? Um, but that's exactly why we were taking those, those poop samples is to see maybe are there parasites that they're sharing back and forth and, um, and how can we help with that? All right. Uh, shifting back to whales, Caleb in Newfoundland is wondering about the lifespan of a sperm whale. Ooh. I am, am not positive what we what we're, um, you know, with whales in general, it is, we're always sort of guessing um, because they live, a, we, they live a very long time, we know that. Um, but it's hard for us to know exactly how old they are because um, when we hunt them, we're killing them before they would die naturally, of course. And when they die naturally, they sink. Um, and they become a really important source of food and this whole other ecosystem on the bottom of the ocean. Um, but then we can't access them to try and use some of the techniques that we would use to figure out how old they are. Um, I think, you know, our best guess for, for whales of that size is usually somewhere around, you know, 80 years or so um, would be their lifespan, but we're not 100% positive the way that we can be with other animals. All right, very cool. Um, really cool video you shared landing uh, in that really remote area. So what have you learned uh, from uh, th those communities you've worked with about sustainability? Great question. Um, I think one of the really interesting things about working in Papua New Guinea um, is that people there own the majority of their land. And so it's it's a bit of a different setup and that means that people can on their own create these conservation spaces that are very big and significant. Um, and they can do that because that land is theirs to, to give over. Um, and so it's, you know, sometimes with the work that I do, um, it can take a minute to explain to people um, or for people to really understand how our health is connected to animal health or to environmental health. Um, because especially maybe if you're in an urban area, it seems like these things are all kind of happening far away and maybe that matters somewhere else, but not really for you. And so it's harder for us to see that direct interaction. Um, and so in a community like this one in Papua New Guinea, you don't need to spend any time sort of explaining that their health matters you know, is connected to environmental health or animal health because they're living as part of that ecosystem. And it's very obvious, um, you know, you don't need to come in from the outside and, and tell them that. And so working in those communities, there is um, already that understanding of that connection. Um, and because of that, they're, yeah, hugely focused on sustainability and, and how to, you know, develop and get access to some of these um, you know, the beneficial parts of that development, like healthcare infrastructure, or education, um, but also doing that in a way that doesn't destroy the environment because they know that that then impacts their own health as well. All right. One more question to take us home today. Uh, Jamina, advice for young explorers. What advice would you give the young explorer tuning in uh, today? Oh, I, um, above all, recommend um, 
figuring out or just following what you're curious about. Um, I think we are all curious about different things and it's okay if that's more than one thing. I, when I was young, I was really confused about, I love photography, but I also really love biology and I'm going to have to pick one. And, um, you know, I spent a lot of my life trying to tell myself I had to pick one and um, ended up figuring out ways to not. And, and so I just, for young explorers, I want you to, to understand that there are now more than ever so many ways to do the thing that you're passionate about, even if it, it's not out there as what looks like a setup career already. There are ways for you to follow that curiosity and develop it and um, really go after these sorts of things that you care about. And so um, just see where, where you are already, um, you know, what, what, whatever you're curious about, follow that. Um, and it might look a little different than um, what some other folks are doing out there, but it's okay um, to make that, make that own life for yourself. All right, great advice uh, for people joining us. So first of all, a huge shout out to uh, those joining us on YouTube. Thanks for joining us today and sending in some questions. Obviously we have a ton of more events coming up over the next two weeks. So take a little time uh, to visit the website and check out what's coming up. We hope to see your groups uh, joining in again. In fact, I'll share that link in the chat sidebar right now. There we go. Uh, and Jamina, thank you so much for spending some time with us, sharing some of your adventures around the world and uh, the really cool way that you're blending photography, storytelling uh, and eco health. It's pretty awesome. Thank you so much, Joe. And thank you to everyone who's tuning in uh, live right now. Thank you for your questions. All right. Uh, lots of fun. We, I think we still have one more event today. So in about 15 minutes, you can stay on this channel. Uh, we have SciCom story time with uh, Nick Underwood. He is a NOAA hurricane uh, pilot, uh, fly surveys over the Arctic, looking for marine mammals. So that should be a lot of fun. I hope to see some of the viewers tuning into that event as well today. All right. Thanks, everyone. All right. Thank you, everyone.